worth your time, yes? Is there absolute truth? Well, we saw in this video a number of answers to this question. No, some said truth is relative. Others said yes, but it actually changes depending on what truth is most convincing. One said, well, it's based on your own personal experiences. Another said, it's your own beliefs that determine what absolute truth is. One said that it is uh, what you discover inside of you. One person said, well, that's, that's hard to answer. Another person said, well, that's a good question. I've never thought about it. Wow, you mean you have never taken the time to actually contemplate whether or not there is absolute truth that exists? Some said yes, there is absolute truth, but it is actually that truth is based upon the culture in which you live in or the society in which you are engaged in. But you see, there's a problem with that, and it's this. A lie doesn't become truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it is accepted by the majority. Is there absolute truth? Well, much of the world will tell you no, or I don't know, or that all truth is relative. The Christian faith, on the other hand, answers that question with an emphatic yes. There is such a thing as absolute truth. And that is why the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 exhorted us in this way. Would you read this out loud with me? He said, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And then in Jude chapter 1 verse 3, we read this. Let's read it out loud. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing to that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Contend for the faith. We will talk about that in another message, but in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15, he tells us that we are to make a defense for the hope that is within us. This word defense, it is the Greek word apologia. And to give you some background in regard to apologia, Plato used this word in the title of his book, The Apology, which was actually a record of Socrates' defense against his enemies in a court of law. A defense in which Socrates eventually lost, by the way, but in its most basic sense, an apologia, or more specifically, an apologist, is someone who gives a defense for something, just like that little boy gave a defense for the existence of God in the video that we saw last week. And so, apologia is not apologizing for our faith. It's not walking around and saying, oh, God. Oh, I, I just want you to know, before I even introduce myself, I'm really sorry for being a Christian. <laughs> I, just, I, I'm, I, I don't want to bum you out. I, I apologize. I know it might make you feel uncomfortable. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm a Christian. That's not 
what the word means. It means just the opposite. It means to make a stand. In the case of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter is instructing and exhorting Christians to be ready to make a defense for their hope in Jesus. Simply put, he is telling each and every one of us, be ready to give reasons why you believe and what you believe about your faith in the person of Jesus Christ. And so in that sense, we are all called to be apologists. We are all called to be defenders of the faith. And the reason why is because we believe that there is such a thing as absolute truth. And that that truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is important for us to know because every age has had its opponents and its critics of Christianity. And so that means in every age, Christianity has needed defenders of the faith. Every age has also had its distortions and deceptions and downright heresies to contend with concerning the Christian faith. All the way from the Gnostics of Paul's time to Arius who rejected the deity of Christ to aberrant teachings of Catholicism and other forms of Christianity to the God is dead movement in the dark ages to modernism and humanism and every other kind of ism to present day postmodernism and pluralism which is widespread throughout America and throughout Europe Christianity has faced its critics head on with the claim that there is such a thing as absolute truth and it exists in the pages of scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ and perhaps the two greatest opponents to absolute truth today is postmodernism number one and pluralism number two now postmodernism is hard to define in some ways because it is all over the map but the basic presupposition of postmodernism is that there is no absolute truth and so postmodernism is the age of relativism everything is relative and so as we saw on the video what may be true for you is not true for me because truth after all is relative you see it is not absolute now pluralism on the other hand it believes with very few exceptions that all beliefs are equally true let me say that again pluralism believes that all beliefs are equally true and therefore pluralism teaches that there are many different paths to heaven and so in that sense parallelism it actually believes in parallel truths listen even though one of those quote truths unquote will be in direct contrast and opposite opposition to the other truth quote unquote and so think about that even though there is a direct contradiction and opposition of one position to another position they are both equally true in the eyes of the pluralists and and so what we need to understand is that these are very powerful and prevalent thoughts and philosophies in our present day culture right here in the United States and certainly here in Humboldt, California. And when you're talking about pluralism, I, I really believe that there's a great 
example that uh, we can look at, a great illustration that we could look at that revolves around the picture of an elephant and five blindfolded or blind men. Look at the screen. Look at the picture of this elephant and the five blindfolded individuals. One grabs hold of the trunk and he declares that he is holding on to a snake. The other holds on to the opposite end, the tail, and he declares that he is holding on to a rope. Another touches the ears and he says, this is a fan. Another grabs hold of the leg and he says, this is a column. And then another touches the body and he says, this is a wall. This is pluralism, my friends. Pluralism says that this is the case with all faiths and with all religion and that no religion has all the truth, just little parts of it. And each is right in its own experience and revelation. But you see, here's the deal. When you are spiritually blind, that's the best you can come up with. And so Christianity, on the other hand, says, no, I too was once blind, but now I see, and that there is an elephant. <laughs> it's an elephant. It isn't a snake, it isn't a rope, it isn't a column, it isn't a fan, it isn't a wall. That there is an elephant. And so simply put, Christianity believes in absolute truth. Not what you want it to be or think it might be because listen, you are blinded to the truth. So this morning, and then again next week, we are going to be looking at 10 reasons to believe in Christianity. 10 reasons to believe in the Christian faith. And if you are a believer, 10 reasons why you can walk in confidence when it comes to the Christian faith. We're going to look at five this morning and five again next week. And the first reason we can be confident in the Christian faith, and the first reason why you should believe in the Christian faith is this. The Christian faith is an exclusive faith. Again, the Christian faith is an exclusive faith, meaning this, by its very nature, if Christianity is right, all other faiths, all other religions, all other philosophies are wrong. You see, Jesus made it very clear. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody could come to the Father but through him. In the book of Acts, we are told that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The first epistle of John chapter 5, I believe verse 21, it tells us that he who has the Son, that is Jesus Christ, has the life, speaking of eternal life. But he who does not have the Son does not have the life. That, my friends, is an emphatic statement, and it is an exclusive statement. And so what this means is that Christianity is an exclusive religion. Religion. It is an exclusive faith, which means this. Though all are welcomed, it's not exclusive in that people are not invited and welcomed. Uh, for whosoever shall come, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so it is inclusive in that way, but it is exclusive in that if Christianity is right, then all other religions, all other faiths, then all other philosophies are wrong. Simply put, from a Christian worldview, the Christian faith is the only true faith. Number two, the reason why you can be confident in the Christian faith and the reason why you should believe in the Christian faith if you do not yet do that is that the Christian faith is an intelligent, rational faith. 
Again, it is an intelligent and rational faith. In other words, becoming a Christian doesn't mean that someone has to commit intellectual suicide, where we're a bunch of idiots running around, babbling and not knowing what we believe in or what we are talking about. As a matter of fact, the God of the Bible commands us and therefore expects us to use our minds. And part of the great commandment is that we are to love the Lord our God with all our mind. Which means this, Christianity appeals to the mind as well as the heart. Now, those out in the world, those who are skeptics and scoffers and disbelievers, they will say that Christianity is nothing but blind faith. And blind faith is faith apart from reason. And therefore, it is a giant leap into the dark. Well, that, my friends, is not biblical faith. That is not biblical faith in any way, shape, or form. God does not ask us, expect us, or require us to have a blind faith. Then others say that, well, it is a weak faith. And it's a weak faith because the, the heart is trying to believe something that the mind cannot accept or make sense of. And that, my friends, isn't a leap in the dark, but it is stumbling in the dark. But then we look at true Christianity. And true Christianity is a strong faith. True Christians have a strong faith. True Christianity is a real faith. And it's a real faith because it is something that is number one, reasonable, number two, rational, and number three, relevant. We're going to look next week at the practicality of the Christian faith. It is a reasonable and rational and relevant faith, and let me also suggest and actually declare that it is also a responsible faith. It's the most responsible faith that exists in the universe. Because God expects us to be responsible in regard to what He says and how He expects us to live our lives. And this, my friends, is a step into the light. It is where revelation and wisdom come in the knowledge of Christ. You see, God wants us to have an intelligent faith, and He wants us to have an intelligent affection. He wants our faith to impact both our heart and our head. Furthermore, Christianity embraces an intelligent design in creation and the universe versus the theory of evolution. I'll probably be commenting over the next few weeks on the theory of evolution and let us be reminded that it is only a theory. It's the theory of evolution. And so we're going to talk about it. Maybe the message will be how to make a, a, a monkey out of Darwinism. I don't know. But it certainly isn't fact. It's theory and theory only. And so this is the deal when it comes to evolution. It takes more faith to believe in evolution and that all this universe exists and came out of nothing or it was some random accident, some Big Bang theory, than it does believing in a creator and an intelligent design. Christianity is an intelligent faith because it has an intelligent God, an intelligent creator who had an intelligent design for the universe and he has an intelligent design for you and for me. 
As a matter of fact, some of the world's greatest minds and greatest scientists have actually been Christians. You could go back to Galileo, who was uh, arguably one of the greatest astronomers to ever walk the face of the earth, and he discovered, among other things, that the earth revolves around the sun. Copernicus, who was a great mathematician and uh, also an astronomer, among other things, he discovered the solar system and how the solar system revolved around the sun and not the earth. Sir Isaac Newton, the dude invented calculus. That is a miracle in my mind. <laughs> But he not only discovered or invented calculus, he also discovered the law of gravity. Johannes Kepler, founder of physical astronomy, he discovered laws of planetary motion. Robert Boyle is the founder of modern day chemistry. John Dalton is the founder of atomic theory. Matthew Murray, Ryan, you will like this, he is the founder of oceanography. James Simpson discovered chloroform and he laid the foundation for anesthesiology and the list goes on and on and on. These were not only great minds, they were also great Christians that have radically influenced and impacted the world that we live in in a scientific way, not just a spiritual way. And so we can have confidence because the Christian faith is not an ignorant faith, as some proclaim. It is the most intelligent faith that exists because it comes from an intelligent, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful God. Number three. You can have confidence in the Christian faith because the Christian faith is a historic, consistent, factual faith. Again, the Christian faith is a historic, factual faith. Loved ones, Christianity is not a philosophical faith that appeals to the philosophies of man. Nor is it a mythological faith based upon the myths and the legends of man. Rather, listen, Christianity appeals to history and the facts of history. You see, the Bible is the greatest historical book ever written bar none. If you want to know history, read the Bible. And the reason why it is so so great is that God inspired it and it was written in large ways though God allowed man to uh, reveal things of his own nature and his own thinking but this originated from God's perspective and therefore it is a hundred percent accurate read the Bible and you will see some great historians like Luke, who is also a physician. Read Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter uh, 3 and just see how historically accurate he was. And so you see the Bible addresses times and places and people and events that can actually be proven and that actually existed in history. And so that means that Christianity is not an abstract faith. It is a historic, factual faith that points to times and places and people and events. Number four, we can have confidence in the Christian faith because the Christian faith is a Christocentric faith. In other words, we have faith in a person, that is, the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And you see, it is a faith in who He is, the Christ, the Son of the living God who made claims about Himself that no other religious leader that has ever lived has been able to make. 
And so it is a faith in who he is, first and foremost. It is a faith in what he did. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose on the third day, that so whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. And it is a faith in what he said. He proclaimed to be God the Son. He proclaimed to be Savior of the world. Once again, the Christian faith is not an abstract faith, nor is it based upon the philosophies of man. Christianity is an objective faith pointing to the person of Jesus Christ, His life, His death, His resurrection, and His teachings. Nor is it a subjective faith where you go on feelings rather than facts. That how you feel about something is actually more important than fact or absolute truth. Or where people will tell you that it does not matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. How ridiculous is that? Seriously, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something that is beyond reason. It is a ridiculous thought that thinks that just because you believe it's okay and it's automatically true. That is not the case with the Christian faith. It is not subjective. It is a not, it's not a faith, in other words, without substance. It's not faith in some nebulous force or energy. It's not faith in yourself. Christianity is Christocentric, meaning it centers on the person of Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Because truth doesn't change. And he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so Christianity is an objective, historical, consistent, Christocentric, intelligent faith. And then the fifth and the final reason, loved ones, you can have a confidence in the Christian faith. And if you are here today and you are not sure, the Christian faith is a miraculous faith. The Christian faith is a miraculous faith. You see, from its very inception to its very end, the Christian faith is a miraculous faith, beginning with the virgin birth, the incarnation of Christ, who became fully man, while at the same time being fully God. That, my friends, is not only a mystery, it is a miracle. As you read the Gospels of Jesus, you study and you see his miraculous life and all the various miracles he performed. His resurrection from the dead was miraculous. You continue to read on in the book of Acts, the miracles and the life of the apostles, and really throughout the entire history of the church, to Christ returned to earth, the Christian faith, my friends, is adorned with miracles. It's like a Christmas tree that is adorned with all of these balls and, and and little trinkets and so forth. We see that all throughout the Christian faith. You see, much like Thomas Jefferson attempted to do when he blacked out from his Bible all the miracles that were recorded in it. Did you know that he did that? A miracle, don't believe in that. Cross that out, cross that out, cross that out. His Bible was filled with more black marks than it was anything else because Christianity 
is a miraculous faith. You see, to separate the Christian faith from the miraculous is actually to deny the acts of God among men and the manifestation of His glory on the earth. One of my uh, paper projects, uh, writing projects that I did in my master's program revolved around this very topic. I wrote a paper that uh, really went all the way back to the Old Testament, but beginning with the day of Pentecost from the inception of the church, God has used miracles as a me missionary mechanism to advance the gospel message and to advance the kingdom of God. All the way up to present day. God's kingdom, my friends, is a miraculous kingdom. It always has been and it always will be. You see, the works of God, miracles, are given to confirm the word of God, the message. The miracles confirm the message. Let me read for you if you would like to. You could turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 5 verse 36 we'll just be there for a moment so if you want to just listen to it feel free to do so Matthew chapter or excuse me John chapter 5 verse 36 says this but the testimony which I have this is Jesus speaking is greater than the testimony of John. Here it is. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 20, it says this, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs, that is the miracles that followed. And so you see, miracles and Christianity are intricately intertwined. How many in your Christian life have seen an answer to prayer, have seen a miracle, have been healed, or you know of somebody who has been healed? Can I see a show of hands? Look around you. You cannot separate the Christian faith from the miraculous. You cannot have one without the other. And so to deny miracles is to deny the Christian faith. And the reason why is very simple. The God of the Bible is a supernatural God. God is actively involved in creation and in world events and in the lives of people just like you and me and we see this from Genesis to the book of Revelation and so loved ones miracles are evidence of God's involvement in creation and in humanity we can have a confidence in what we believe and in who we are as Christians we need not doubt we need not struggle we need not wonder we we can walk in authority because our faith comes from the ultimate authority, and that is God himself and his word, which he gave to us. And so... Why should we believe in the Christian faith? Why can we have confidence? The Christian faith is an exclusive faith. Again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Christian faith is an intelligent, rational faith. The Christian faith is a historic, consistent, and factual faith. The Christian faith is a Christocentric faith. It is focused and founded upon the person of Jesus Christ. He is the central figure all the way throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And finally, for today, the Christian faith 
is a miraculous faith. We've seen it, and many of us have experienced it. Would you stand with me? And let's close in this prayer. Let's pray this out loud. By the way, this prayer, if you would like it, will be out in the lobby, I believe, on the table. If you'd like to put it in your, your Bible and refer to it from time to time. Let's, let's begin. Let's pray out loud. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no name under heaven by which we can be saved. For your name is mighty and matchless. Your word tells us that he who has the Son has the life. But he who does not have the Son does not have the life. Thank you that you are both light and life and that you lead us in the way everlasting. Thank you that you do not ask us to blindly follow or believe in you. That you have given us a faith that is real, reasonable, rational, and intelligent. Thank you for historic, factual faith which has remained consistent throughout the ages and one that centers in, on, and around you. Thank you that we do not earn our way to heaven, but we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And thank you that the Christian faith is a miraculous faith because you are a supernatural God. There is none like you, no, not even one. You stand alone, and the made-up gods that we make in our own likeness cannot compare to your glorious majesty. Heaven is your throne, and earth is your footstool. And one day, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward, the elders to come forward. We're going to close in a time of uh, prayer right now. But I want to appeal to you if you are here today and you have never embraced the absolute truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he was the truth and he said if you know the truth that it will set you free. And Jesus' desire today is to set you free from your fears and your doubts, your struggles, but most importantly, your sin. Because we have all sinned, Scripture says, and fallen short of the glory of God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can walk into freedom today. It's a freedom that is found not in being a good person, but in surrendering to a good God. It is found not in anything this world will teach you or offer you, but it is found in a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And it's so simple. It's so simple. He wants your faith. He wants your belief. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. Surrender that to Him, and you will be forgiven. You will be filled with His Spirit, and He will give you a future and a hope. No greater deal has ever been made, and it was initiated by God Himself to sinners like you and like me. I encourage you to take opportunity and grab hold of the person of Jesus today and never let Him go. God bless you. If you need prayer for anything, would you come and let the prayer team pray for you?
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all the ground is sinking sand. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil and on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking Sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is come. His blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay, and on Christ this solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Christ is solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand Savior to represent that truth. God, we thank you for your word that is unchanging, that we can trust in with all our hearts, God. 
I pray for everyone here, God, that we wouldn't be tossed about by the waves of this world, God, the influences of our culture. You just put in us just a steady heart, God, that we would trust in you. Cause on Christ this solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Well, on Christ this solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you, Lord. I see you'd bless everybody here, God, as we go our own ways. You'd be with us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was told that there are cookies and other good desserts outside, and it's in celebration of Pastor D's birthday, which is today, and, and Linda's birthday, yeah, which is on Thursday. So make sure you guys all give them a hug before you leave and say that you love them. Yeah. God bless you all.